Good afternoon and welcome to the road to recovery, the road to freedom with Mark. Let me just get this microphone in place. Yes, it is afternoon, it's Friday. It's when I do my shows. Friday afternoon, 28 minutes worth. I hope you enjoy it. I certainly do. I have a lot of fun doing these things. And uh, it's always nice to read my stories to remind myself of other times, better times in my life, times of world travel and adventure and trips around New Zealand that I've had, so many wonderful places that I've been all around this magnificent country. But my show was The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom. It's not just about reading stories, although that's part of it, but my show was about uh, mental health, about um, being unwell, about suffering through it, struggling through it, and hopefully coming out the other end and perhaps a bit of assistance I can lend through personal experience. Now, this week is um, <coughs> Mental Awareness Week. I don't think we really need that. I mean, we're pretty aware these days. It's good. But it's nice that things like that get highlighted. When I first started this show some five years ago, um, mental health was hardly ever mentioned other than a few souls in the wilderness, a few of us, not many. And then all of a sudden it became the fashionable thing after global... Uh, warming and then it became change and now it's become crisis but in the meantime it's kind of been superseded by the latest fashion which is mental health and now everyone's um, you know nodding as they should politically correct and it kind of sickens me that everyone jumps on these bandwagons and pretends like there's some kind of um, knight in shining armour riding to my emotional rescue. Believe you me, I've been doing this a lot longer than most and I'll be here long after it's become yesterday's newspaper, today's fish and chip paper. I'll still be banging away because this is not something I have an interest in. This is something I am. This is how I live, this is what I have to go through and have gone through for most of my life. Now in saying that, most mental illnesses, not all but most, are recoverable or at the very least manageable. For me, unfortunately, it falls into the latter category, but it is manageable and you need to learn the little tips and tricks. Unfortunately, once you're in that position, it's kind of like going to prison, pretty much. I mean, basically, no one is going to look at you for a decent job. If you say, oh, yeah, I've had five years off with mental unwellness, there is still a hell of a lot of prejudice, not so much now from society, but a pervasive prejudice in management of any and all businesses with the exception of just a tiny few. Most of them, there's no way they're going to touch you. You're never going to have a decent job. You're never going to have decent pay again. You're going to have to start working volunteer. Um, that's bullshit speak for free, right? So you work for nothing for a while to gain experience and then you hop on the bottom ladder of rung of that ladder now you may have been halfway up or three quarters in your previous life but now son now that you're mentally unwell you're right back down the bottom and not only that you've lost 25 years of your life and by the time you get to any kind of decent wage above working poor it's very unlikely by the time i hit 65 i would ever be above the working poor so i'd be working and on the dole at the same time because i can't afford mortgage insurance and food that's the situation we find ourselves in poverty <coughs> poverty does not cause mental health but it exacerbates it it makes it much 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 worse when people are struggling they stress and stress is the beginning Stress is the tide that starts lapping away at the foundations as it's coming on in there, coming on to you. It erodes your confidence, it erodes your self-belief, it erodes your courage. And I found in the early days, before I had a real bad collapse, it started off just with anxiety, you know, that knot in the stomach that keeps rising 
all of the time and gets worse and worse and worse. You're pushing and shoving with thousands, tens of thousands of others down the motorway, choking the place up, everyone driving terribly badly, someone crashes, everyone has to rub a neck and you're late for work. The boss is on you, why are you late? And you try and say, look, I'm very sorry there was a crash. And, you know, I had managers who used to ring the police up to ensure that it was a crash so I wasn't lying about being late. And when you get that kind of behaviour, you think, there is something radically, radically wrong with this. And a lot of people are treated like that. It's comply or be punished. That is how our system works. So if you don't do as you're told and you don't turn up on time and do what you're told to do, then you will be punished, whether it be a written warning so that the sword of Damocles is hanging over your head, another step wrong, son, and you're off down the road. And there's plenty more queuing up for your job. So fear is used against you. The fear that you would lose your job and therefore lose your house lose your savings, lose your life and have to start all over again. That fear is held over you all the time when you are working and this is not my experience with one job, this is my experience with at least six jobs in a row like that and I had one, one good manager in the oh, over 20 years that I worked in plumbing and building I had one good manager and he died of a heart attack at the age of 52, Selwyn Giles, a hell of a nice chap, one of the best chaps I ever worked for, and all he did was show me some consideration and reward me where I did well, and the better I did, the more I aspired, the more he got out of me, I was the most productive person he ever had working for him. And that is the difference between the whip and the carrot, and unfortunately our society works on the whip. So you are basically punished if you fail the rules in some way, no matter how petty or ridiculous they might be. So it starts with a knot in the stomach. Then you feel almost kind of like a grip on your heart, this kind of panic and crushing in your chest, and you feel your heart going right up to your throat. And then you find... The next step is you start sweating. And once you've started sweating, your hands start shaking. Now, if you've got to that point where you're driving to work and you are sweating and your hands are shaking and you've got a knot in your stomach and you feel like you're going to throw up, alarm bells are ringing loud, my friend, and there are many of you out there I know who are in exactly that same situation that I was in, and you need help. Not because you're suffering from mental illness, but because you're about to. You're about to go flying off that cliff, my friend, and it's a long way down to the bottom. So, before things go wrong, do something about it. Prevention saves so so much and there are simple things that you can do because once you get into that position you get lost you lose focus and instead you get this kind of tunnel vision you think it's focused but it's not it's, it's myopic really because you get lost in a certain train of thinking and it's harder and harder to see anything else it's like you can't see the grass for the trees right if you're really really stuck trapped in that situation which is just going over and over again you come to that point where you just you can't see any way out you can't see an alternative so what you need to do is get some help and find someone who you can relate to who tells you things that you hadn't necessarily considered or at least had pushed back to the background. Now, I met a lady like that called Aruna Patel, and being of, of Indian descent, she was far more kind of spiritual than most. Um, they tend to be very much that way, and she often talked to me about mindfulness, about being aware of the moment and the good things that can exist in that instead of looking at the giant pile of crap your life has become. 
So taking joy from the small things, and I do I do mean that. It's a carefully chosen word, joy. That upwelling, that uplifting, that lightening of your heart and your mind and indeed your soul through simple things that you can enjoy. And when you are lost in all the horrible shit that's going down in your life, whatever that might be, and some of those things could well be out of your control, it is important to talk to people who you can relate to, who are going to give you good, positive ideas, and then enjoy those little things. It might be, I don't know, a honey lemon drink, what the hell, a walk down the river, catching a fish, whatever that thing is that you love. But being more mindful, aware and awake, I often go um, just before the spring, the tuis congregate in these gum trees down by the river and they put on a show. And I often go down there, sit there and have a cigarette and yes, I do still smoke and I know it's killing me and all that, but what the hell. I go down there and watch those tuis and I just forget about everything, just for a little while. And it's almost like, a relief to just forget about things for a while and over the last sort of five years I've tried to concentrate more and more and more on enjoying those small bites and taking myself away from all of my stresses and troubles. My father was in end of life care for about three years and I watched him die very slowly. Then my mother got um, Alzheimer's didn't know where she was or what was going on, broke her leg a number of times, her arm, had a brain clot and again died very slowly. So, you know, I've been through the bloody mill over the last five years, um, as, as have my family. And it's never easy, you know, now we're coming up to this vote for end of life care and I, I you know, in the end of life and that. And I really, really wish that that had have happened a long time ago because it was extraordinarily tough um, watching my parents suffer as they did and, and die very slowly and, and there was nothing I could do. You know, all I could do was just hold their hands and talk to them and, and, and watch them deteriorate and that was soul-destroying and, and mentally um, damaging. So it would be nice to think that there was... Um, you know, something done mindfully and carefully with due consideration. This is not about getting rid of people. This is about caring about people. And let's hope that we bear that in mind when we um, when we come to vote. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to vote. It's not my job. It's my job to tell you to get informed. Please, please. Do it now. There's websites you can go to. You can get all the information, both sides. Look at both sides and make a careful, considered decision and above all else vote. Especially you young people, please get out there and vote. If this is your first time, welcome. Welcome to running the world because that's what you're doing. You're voting for your government. So please vote. Please have your say. It's very important that you do. Um, all of us working together can make a big difference to our society and make it a lot better place. Right, well, I've got to bang on with my story today because I've had enough of rant about mental wellness. Let's cover something a little bit more happy, eh? Not that, not that this show isn't happy. You know, I like to think that in some ironic and sarcastic way I make people laugh, eh? I tell a few little jokes here and there, but I guess behind it all is that concern that a lot of people suffer unnecessarily and we can do a hell of a lot to help. Uh, all of us, in our own small way, even if it's just a kind word, it can make such a difference. And I always bang on about this, but kindness and consideration are the things that are truly lacking in society today there is far too much selfishness people are just oblivious you know blocking supermarket aisles so they can have a chitty chat and make everyone walk around them you know if you're sharing a public space please show consideration towards others and don't just do whatever the hell you want and stuff everybody else because that 
sort of attitude is erosive and that's what damages people and that's why there's so much mental illness in this country is because we're not looking after each other well enough and it's what we need to do. That's why I'm here. Cost me money to do. Some sunny day, who knows, I might get a sponsor. 120 bucks a month, you know. I see these people raising hundreds and thousands and millions. It would be nice if from the beginning they had have bothered to sponsor shows like this who were the trailblazers in the beginning and who still continue to do the mahi um, at our own expense. It's tough. It's tough for me. But it's the way it is, and it isn't going to stop me just because it's tough. <laughs> I've been through a lot of tough things before in my life, and this is nothing but comparison to some I've had to face. Anyway, this is Victoria Falls and Wangi Game Park. Four of us, C.D., Wayne, Dave and myself, drove west across the northern Kalahari. We had just come from Chobe National Game Park in Botswana and headed through into Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. Robert Mugabe had only been in power for a few years and Zimbabwe, though now poor, still had signs of what a rich country it was when it was southern Rhodesia. The many years of war, however, had financially crippled the new Zimbabwe, and no improvement was in sight. This meant the tourists who did venture up had plenty to spend and there was no shortage of accommodation. As we left Chobe, the desert started to take over again, so I drove from dawn till dark to get through to Victoria Falls. It's also named the Smoke That Thunders, and a few kilometres from the falls we could hear them, and see the mist in the sky above. Victoria Falls are reputed to be the largest in the world, and they are truly a sight to behold. Even before we lay eyes on them, they are impressed with a mighty thundering sound as we approach. The massive Zambezi River feeds this natural wonder, and at first it is hard to take it all in, as it is some 1,700 metres long, and 100 metres from top to bottom. The Zambezi spills over a level sheet of basalt, making the drop sharp and spectacular. It is so sharp that it creates a permanent mist rising high up in the air to about 400 metres. It creates a rainbow above the falls by day, and a, moona, and a lunar moonbow can be seen on the full moon. The spray comes shooting upwards like inverted rain. Despite having been discovered by Livingston as late as 1855, it has captivated tourists ever since and we were no exceptions. We spent the best part of the first day on the more spectacular Zimbabwe side, where it is possible to get right up to the edge of the falls to see the bottom. It was very slippery and dangerous at the edge, but well worth the view to take a peek over the top and see all the way to the bottom of the falls. We were there in late summer, so the falls had reduced to a series of about nine discernible falls. Each one of them impressive in itself, but the series together was truly breathtaking. At the end of the falls were a load of the biggest crocodiles I have ever seen with the falls acting like a smorgasbord for the massive beasts. The next day we crossed up to Zambia via Victoria Falls Bridge, which allows a unique view up the falls. Zambia was in worse financial state than Zimbabwe, and black market money traders haggled openly for hard currency right outside the border guard's building. We left the car at the border and took a taxi to the nearest town to get on the gin and tonics. We then returned to one of the safari lodges where we had a fine meal on the riverfront as we watched the massive burning red sun slowly dip to the horizon. Unfortunately, we drank too much and got stuck in Zambia when we missed the border closing. We were forced to sleep in the open despite the warning signs of roaming lions. I ended up instead being eaten alive by mosquitoes, but relieved the next morning. We spent a few days at Victoria Falls, viewing them from every angle possible, spellbound by the great length and volume of these magnificent falls. 
The weather was very hot and lent itself to drinking and wandering along the falls. Altogether too soon, it was time to leave Victoria Falls and head south to Whangy National Game Park. Whangy Park is dotted with natural water holes called pans. Some are fed by natural springs and some by two large lakes in the north of the park. We were immediately impressed by the infrastructure of the park. We headed to the northern section and booked into Cinnamon Teller Camp. The camp was a fenced compound on the top of a hill with spectacular views. It also had a small shop run by a local guy who we called Phil for short. It was a very happy and personable guy and sorted out a two bedroom hut for us which had a fridge and even featured a hot bath. We decided to make Cinnamon Teller our base camp and concentrate our game spotting to the northern section of the park. At the nearest waterholes we met with another luxury, viewing, viewing platforms. These platforms were one storey high with stairs leading up to glass enclosed rooms where it was safe to view the game that came down to drink. The platform also offered shade from the oppressive heat of midday sun. The watering holes or pans were like magnets for game. Each type of game had its turn at the watering hole so it wasn't necessary to chase the game about. Whilst at one of the viewing platforms I met a biologist who was on holiday. He pointed out the hundreds of different species of birds to me which made for great viewing with my binoculars. It opened up another layer of life to me and emphasised just how busy the watering holes really were. Huangi boasts many hundreds of species of birds, so there was a constant change of different birds to view. The larger game, however, were truly breathtaking. By being out of sight and smell of the larger animals, they would approach without fear or inhibition. Now, on our first day at Huangi, we were treated by a smorgasbord of different game at the waterholes, from the giraffes in the middle of the day to the antelope in the afternoon to the elephants in the early evening and sunset. Each species seemed to have a certain time of day they preferred to drink, so it was unnecessary to move out, of, out from our superb viewing platform. They also seem to have different personalities, with some like the gazelle always tense and nervous, while the lights of the elephants were very relaxed and came to bathe and play. The next day we got up early to make the most of the change of light when predators are on the prowl. Despite the early rise, we did not see a kill, as these are few and far between. Instead, we spent a great day on the viewing platforms where we were treated to some amazing sights. At one stage we saw some beautiful kudu come down to drink. First the large males with their beautiful corkscrew horns came down and checked out the water for crocodiles, stamping and sipping cautiously. These beautiful animals then formed up like sentinels, making a corridor for the females and young to walk down. The males stood guard facing outward whilst the females and young took a drink. When they finished, they melted away, slow and orderly, like a military exercise. It was amazing to see the degree of caution and cooperation the kudu showed, something no zoo could ever show you. Every species seemed to have instinctive and sophisticated survival behaviour, which was amazing to witness. The confidence of one animal seemed to flow onto others and it was amazing to see so many different animals drinking with such a relaxed attitude. The huge numbers of animals the waterholes attracted were quite staggering and it was a real privilege to experience game spotting at our best. On the third day, we arrived back at camp just on sunset and Phil was jumping around the lodge in an excited state. I parked up and jumped out as Phil shouted and pointed. With my binoculars handy and our high vantage point, I quickly picked out the lion that he was pointing out. Slowly it crept up on its prey, using the long grass to disguise it. Once within striking distance, it broke cover and sprinted towards the unsuspecting warthog. 
As soon as the hawk spotted the lion, it squealed and sprinted off, but to no avail. The lion swiped the hog across the shoulder and sent it spiralling across the ground. With one quick leap, it was upon the hog, grabbing it by the throat, quickly choking the life out of its poor victim. A great amount of dust was kicked up by the scuffle that ensued, and I lost sight of the pair. After a tense minute or so, the lion appeared, dragging the hog by the throat. The entire kill took only a few minutes. It was a case of right place, right time. It was so captivating that those few minutes felt like an hour. Special places like Wangi National Game Park would never be able to reach the glory days of old when hunters paid huge prices to shoot trophy animals. In stark contrast to the rampant poverty in society, countries like Zimbabwe are rich in natural minerals like copper, platinum and gold. Huge profitable mines employing tens of thousands of miners are all over southern Africa. But the region is fraught with social problems. Illiteracy is rampant and people in their millions live in slum conditions. All the, all the time, civil unrest boils along, simmering over now and then. Zimbabwe was a microcosm of southern Africa itself, with gems like Victoria Falls and Hwangi National Game Park and huge mineral wealth a country with massive potential that should be rich, but instead was poisoned by minority rule, then ravaged by ugly civil war. Finally ending up with a dictator like Mugabe was the final nail for Zimbabwe. It is impossible to visit Southern Africa and not be awe-inspired by its natural beauty. So too, it's impossible not to feel for the poor souls who suffer those poor governments. I feel like I lost some of my innocence there, and there seems no easy solutions for the problems of the region. In the many years since I visited the region, the ANC's Mandela government of South Africa came and went, and delivered hope without solutions. Many South Africans of all races and Zimbabweans emigrated to Australia and New Zealand. Successive governments have failed on schooling, health and employment. Zimbabwe, slowly strangled by Mugabe's rule, has suffered badly, but places like Hwangi still exist as def destinations for those keen enough for adventure. For my part, my feeling is of great contrast. I will never forget the falls and the beauty of Hwangi Park. I hold out hope for these magnificent places and their beautiful country. Yet I feel such sorrow as the people of Zimbabwe suffer. I hope someday soon democracy will help them to a better place. I know I will never forget our adventures in the blazing sun. I leave some part of me there and take the memory of those burning sunsets in return. The end. Well, it's my lot for another day. Might have noticed a couple of pauses there. I had to skip and dance a little bit as you do when you're doing live radio. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. Boy, I, I haven't got a little tear in my eye there thinking about Zimbabwe. It's such a beautiful place, you know. It's the sort of place that you really would want to live. I only mentioned a couple of places there. There's a place called the Great Ruins where there was some kind of magnificent civilization that lived there over a thousand years ago. And the Matapose Park down near Lake Kyle uh, it's an incredible place. They have these weird round rocks, rainbow-coloured uh, lizards on them, and lightning bounces off these things when there's a big electrical storm in it. It's just an, an amazing, crazy place, beautiful, and I really wish I could go back there and stay for a while, but I guess my one and only trip out there is, is a young man. I think I was about probably 21, 22 when I was out there. I had a wonderful, wonderful time, and if you ever get the chance, you really should go and check Africa out. It's, it really is a mind-blowing place, a wonderful place. Right, that's me. Have a good week. Thanks to all the sponsors, to Wairapa TV and Michael and Veronica on Arrow Radio. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I hope you share it with your friends. 
and I hope you look after each other. Please bear that in mind, and I'll see you again next week. Bye for now.